When a bumbling MIT professor stumbles upon a formula that can predict the future, he sets out on a wild adventure to save the world, or at least try not to screw it up too badly. So the movie begins with these eerie chants that sound like the lullaby of the devil himself. It's 1959 in Massachusetts, and we are taken to this elementary school with a young girl standing out in front. Her name is Lucinda, and she appears kind of zoned out. Already, I feel kind of bad for her, because she seems weird. And I know we all say children are beautiful and amazing, but they are the most horrible bullies in the world. No cap. Anyway, so in Lucinda's class. The class teacher, Miss Taylor, gives the class an assignment to draw a picture of what they think the world would look like 50 years from then. They would then put their drawings in a time capsule and bury the time capsule on the ground until 50 years later, when other kids like them would dig up the time capsule and see what they drew. I wish I had an imaginative teacher like this. My elementary school would have been much more exciting. I would have looked forward to school. Instead, all I got was, if Mary's train departs London at 12 noon GMT, what would the circumference of the earth be when the robots and aliens finally joined forces to wipe out mankind? Anywho, all the children get to draw. And of course, there's a token spaceship because when you're a kid, all you can imagine 50 years from now is everybody developing laser eyes, becoming robots, carpooling in spaceships, and all that stuff. Lucinda, however, is doing something entirely different. She's writing all these numbers like the kind of numbers all computers in Hollywood are under obligation to display once they are being hacked. Pretty sure that's not how hacking works. But anyway, Lucinda's writing and those whisperings I talked about earlier continue. I think those are the voices of the spirits telling her all those numbers. Time's up, but Lucinda keeps writing. Miss Taylor can't wait anymore, and so she yanks off the paper from Lucinda, but Lucinda just gives this creepy stare, like she should have never done that. In the next scene, the school buries a time capsule. It's a whole ceremony with balloons and old-time music that I don't know how anyone enjoyed, but Lucinda's just off to the side like some kind of ghost, holding a yellow balloon and looking really sad. The next time Miss Taylor looks back to check on her, Lucinda's gone. Vanished. All that's left of her is the balloon she was holding floating up into the air. By nightfall, Lucinda is still nowhere to be found, and the whole school goes looking for her only for her teacher, Miss Taylor, to find her in the school basement with blood on her hands, begging her teacher to make the voices stop whispering. She also appears to have written some numbers, what I assume is the remaining set of numbers she was writing in class before her paper was snatched. By the next scene, we see Nicholas Cage, or more correctly, John Kostler, and his nine-year-old son Caleb. John is an MIT professor, and he appears to have raised a dork, who says things like, I'm going to watch the Discovery Channel, and I can't consume that. I've decided to become a vegetarian. Like, go touch grass, man. Anyway, Caleb appears to be a sad boy, which is understandable because his mom is late. He has some kind of hearing problem as we can see from his hearing aid, which he takes off before going to bed. The next day in class, John is talking to his class about determinism and randomness. Right after, this friend of his, Phil, walks up to him and tells him about his sister-in-law with PH double Ds. Ha <laughs> ha! But John is not interested, and right at that moment remembers that his son has this 50th anniversary school thing that he's supposed to attend to. If you haven't figured it out by now, it's 2009, so per the project, the students of William Dawes Elementary School are supposed to dig up the time capsule that was buried in 1959 and check out what those other students drew. Would be really nice to see all those guys from the 1959 glass, but we did get to see beautiful Miss Taylor, who's older now, but still quite beautiful. So she cuts the tape and the guys dig up the time capsule. When it's time to share the drawings, all the kids go bonkers. You'd think they were sharing free candy. I mean, it's just a drawing, kids. Calm down. When it's Caleb's turn, he starts to hear those whisperings that Lucinda used to hear. Apparently, he received Lucinda's weird submission, and then when he peers over the paper, he sees this weird man standing out alone in the woods. When they get home, John finds out that Caleb has brought Lucinda's submission home. Apparently, Caleb is curious, believing that all those numbers probably mean something, but you know how parents are. So John sends Caleb off to bed, but for some reason, he stumbles on Lucinda's paper again and thinks he should take a crack at it. So he writes out some numbers on his whiteboard and tries to see what the code could be. As he tries his hands at the numbers, he finds out that these could be dates. The first date he finds is 9, and I think you know the other number, with the number 2296 following. As it turns out, precisely 2,296 lives were lost on that fateful day, and this was correctly predicted by Lucinda decades before the accident. So John writes out all the numbers on his board and begins to find that all these numbers are dates on which disaster happened with the number of deaths that happened on those days alongside. There are other numbers that still don't make sense for now, but bottom line, Lucinda predicted the future with astonishing accuracy 50 years prior. Stuff was getting super real and I can only imagine John's worldview shattering because before now he didn't seem all that believing in prophecies and the likes. Anyway, according to Lucinda's papers, there's still a couple of disasters scheduled to happen, so I guess it's about to go down. The next day, John shares his findings with Phil, PH double Ds, but of course, someone who says PH double Ds isn't exactly going to take things seriously, at least not 
on it first. John tries to convince Phil that one of the catastrophes predicted in Lucetta's paper was a fire in which Allison, his wife, died. Still, Phil believes John is only taking this personally because of the pain of losing Allison. John pretty much flips in the bird and goes to look for Miss Taylor to find out about this Lucinda girl. Miss Taylor tells John about Lucinda, including the fact that Lucinda passed away several years ago. John isn't going to let that stop him though, so he tries everything he can to reach anyone with any relationship to the time capsule. Meanwhile at the house, Caleb is playing around with a ball when he starts to hear that whispering again. Then this guy drives by and gives him a black pebble. While John tries to figure out what the pebble is about and how Lucinda died, his sister, Grace, drops by and that's when we find out that John is the son of a pastor and he and his dad have an estranged relationship. Later that night, John finds it hard to sleep. As Lucinda's paper predicts, there's supposed to be a catastrophe that kills 81 people the next day. So John stays up all night listening to the news, trying to find out if the prophecy would come true. But nothing happens and John is beginning to think that maybe his friend, Phil, was right after all. Well, that feeling only lasts until later in the day when he makes his way to his son's school to pick him up. He looks up at his dashboard and then sees the latitude on his map. It turns out to be a set of numbers on Lucinda's paper as well. That's when it hits him. The undecoded numbers are locations and according to Lucinda's papers, the next catastrophe was to happen precisely where he was. Before John can say Jack, an airplane crashes right in front of him. John tries his best to help the victims, but there's only so much he can do. We later find out on the news that four planes crashed that day and a total of 81 people died. Spoopy. Meanwhile, Caleb can tell his dad is acting all weird, but of course John can't exactly tell his son everything that's happening and all the craziness of Lucinda's paper. So he just parents and tells Caleb to go to bed. But then here's the cute part. Nine-year-old Caleb tells his dad that he's not a kid anymore. Ha, <laughs> how cute. Now go watch cartoons. In the middle of the night, Phil, John's friend and colleague, drives out to check on him after finding out that John was at the scene of the plane crash. Together, they both check out Lucinda's number and it appears Phil is finally coming around. But yeah, it's difficult to process. So John turns to the best scientifically proven method for going through rough situations. Angry juice. Anyway, John figures that the last two warnings are directed at him, but Phil thinks he should stay the hell away from the whole shebang. But we already know that's precisely what John will not do. After Phil leaves the house, the strange man who's been appearing to little Caleb appears in his bedroom, and Caleb hears those whisperings again. The man points at Caleb's window, and I don't know how the hell Caleb is not crapping his pants when kids his age are scared of the boogeyman. Anyway, outside the window where the strange man points, Caleb can see a fire and it's burning up everything, but mostly animals. There's no human in sight. He screams for his dad and John runs upstairs to his son. Looking out of the window, John sees a strange man that has been appearing to his son. But before John can rush downstairs and threaten him dad style, the strange man disappears. By the way, John has somewhat figured out that one of the predictions could have something to do with his son. The next day, John decides to go check on Lucinda's living relatives. He finds Lucinda's daughter and creepily stalks her, and her daughter like a perv. Turns out Lucinda's descendants are headed to an animal museum or something. So when he gets to the place, he tries getting conversation with Diana, Lucinda's daughter, while the kids unknowingly find their first love. How did the conversation go? Well, considering that a guy has the social skills of, well, me, I'd say not so well. In fact, he creeps Diana out and makes her run off. When John gets back home, he tries to predict the next catastrophe and where it's going to happen. When he does, he calls the police to warn them, but I don't think the police took him seriously. If anything, they'd probably suspect him. Meanwhile, the number of men watching John's house has multiplied. John figures he needs to put Caleb in safe hands so he can deal with the matter in hand. So he ships Caleb off to his sister's house with a simple warning to make sure that Caleb never watches the news, which is cool because kids are never interested in that anyway. When John leaves his sisters, he makes his way to the center of the next catastrophe as mentioned in Lucinda's prophecy. Of course, the area wasn't sectioned off like he had warned the police to do. So John starts to run around frantically looking for any sign of an attack so he can stop it before it happens. He sees a suspicious looking guy in the subway hiding something in his jacket and somehow thinks he might be the cause of the catastrophe Lucinda prophesied about. But of course, in the end, it turns out to be a big mistake. The guy John is chasing is just some petty movie thieving creep. Barely seconds after John realizes his mistake, the train derails, clapping many people. Later that day, John picks up Caleb from Grace's house. When he gets home, Diane and her daughter are waiting on the steps of his house, and that's when Diana reveals that she knew what John was talking about all along. I don't know why these things always happen in Hollywood. A simple conversation that could have saved some unnecessary drama must be left until said drama has happened. Anyway, Diana reveals that her mother used to talk about all these strange numbers and stuff. She also talked about October 19th a lot as the day when Diana would die. Reciprocating, John in turn shares with her how Allison died in a fire at the hotel where she was working. The accident made John start believing in the randomness of the universe up until he found Lucinda's paper. John, Diana, Abby, and Caleb are in the car now, and John is driving to Lucinda's old home. Of course, they leave the kids alone in the car, so that anyone who wants to kidnap children wouldn't have difficulty finding two cute ones. Diana points out to John that the last symbols on Lucinda's paper were not numbers, but letters. John had initially thought it was 33, but Diana pointed out that it was most likely two backward E's, which we're guessing could be initials. Lucinda's house is as creepy as it goes. Besides the fact that it's abandoned and has all the necessary props set for perfect taunting or a Halloween scary house. In one of the rooms, John and Diana find this picture that appears to be a pictorial representation of the vision of Prophet Ezekiel in the Bible.
Bible. Diana reveals that Lucinda used to stare at the pictures for hours when she was alive, in Lucinda's bedroom, where apparently she clapped herself. John finds some black pebbles, like the ones the strange men gave to Caleb under Lucinda's bed. When he flips the bed, he finds the answer to the EE code. It's everyone else. So I guess the freaking apocalypse is going to happen now. At that moment, Caleb starts to hear whisperings again, and the strange men in black approach him, beckoning him to come with them. Abby can see them too. Luckily, Caleb is smart, so he presses the horn of the car to draw the attention of their parents. When they rush out, John can find one of the strange men in black retreating, so he starts to run after him, holding a gun in his shaky hands. When he finally meets the guy, the strangest thing happens. The strange guy doesn't even try to hurt him or anything. He just opens his mouth and pretty much vomits some weird rainbowish crap and boom, he disappears. Very cool. John heads back to his group and drives them home. It dawns on him that according to Lucinda's prediction, everyone else dies the next day. But Diane is having a hard time believing that. I mean, it's not like Lucinda has a track record of consistently accurate predictions, right? In the morning, John is about to make breakfast when Abby shows him a painting she did. The paper is the same one with a pictorial representation of Prophet Ezekiel's vision. Abby has colored in the sun and it instantly sends John's brain buzzing. That prophecy that had to do with the great sun was the prophecy about the end of the world. A powerful flare from the sun would destroy our world and then kill everyone. Well, this one's a huge spoiler, because at this rate with global warming and the rest, this is definitely how we exit. Immediately, John rushes down to his office at MIT and shares his discovery with his friend, Phil. Phil starts to piss his pants, while Diana manages to stay both depressed and hopeful. They finally settle on hiding underground, although you can tell John isn't exactly holding out much hope. The troop now consisting of John, Diana, Caleb, and Abby go home to pack up their stuff and prepare to go into hiding. John remembers Allison's wish for him to reconcile with his father, so he reaches out to his dad to get him to go underground along with his mom and his sister, Grace. But John's dad doesn't seem to be interested in surviving. He says if it's his time, it's time. And honestly, I kind of feel the guy. Why exactly would you want to spend an extra day longer than you should have, especially if you're going to be the only one left at the end of the day? Anyway, by the time John gets back inside the house, he sees his son scrawling some numbers like Lucinda did at the beginning. That's when it dawns on John that the numbers Lucinda didn't finish writing were the coordinates for the so-called apocalypse. So instead of driving to the caves as agreed, he drives down to Caleb's school. He commits the crime of breaking and entering and steals the door where Lucinda scribbled the remaining numbers. By the time he comes out though, Diana, who by now thinks he's just batshit crazy, drives off to the caves with the kids. While on the way, Diana finds out that the whisper people speak to her daughter and Caleb in their heads, just like they did Lucinda. Diana is understandably shattered, almost driving them right into an accident. She later stops at a gas station to get some stuff, and I don't know how these movies people do it, but she leaves the kids out on their own in the car while she goes into the gas station. Of course, the whisper guys come and kidnap them while she's on the phone with John, telling him where she and the kids are. By the time she realizes the kids are gone, she tries to go racing to save them, but then she gets into a head-on collision with the truck. The accident is ghastly, but she doesn't die immediately. At exactly midnight October 19th though, just like her mom told her, Diana dies, despite the EMT's best efforts to save her. Meanwhile, the government has announced that the sun is going to kill everyone. Very cool. So, everyone is in a crazy panic, and everyone is looting and stuff. Not sure why though. I should probably mention that she found a smooth black pebble on top of the payphone, where she called John. John picked up the pebble from her when he went to see her in the ambulance, and with that started driving until he got to this place, where there were literally thousands of black pebbles. When he gets there, he finds one of the whisper guys, but then he finds Caleb and Abby soon after. They don't seem hurt or even scared. They're even holding rabbits. They explained to John that the whisper people had been keeping them safe all along, and that the whisper people had chosen them to start all over again. However, by them, it turns out that the whisper people mean just Caleb and Abby, so John would have to leave his son to go with the whisper people while he stays back on Earth to suffer. Whatever wrath of Satan is coming for Earthlings. So I guess Caleb and Abby are supposed to go to a new Earth and be their Adam and Eve. That sort of thing. I just hope no one goes on some apple-eating spree, because then it's back to square one. Anyway, Caleb leaves with the whisper people who turn out to be aliens or angels. I can't exactly tell, but he goes with them anyway. Then they all jet out of Earth while John is left on Earth, crying inconsolably. In fact, he passes out right there until morning. As he begins to drive back, he sees that the apocalypse has already started and people are looting. No one seems to care about how this could affect their chances of making it to heaven, or about the obvious fact that if you're dying in two minutes, nothing you loot would be of any use to you. Anyway, John makes his way to his dad's house, which is the best thing to do considering the circumstances. The family shares a big hug together as the fire from the sun completely destroys the whole world. John's father's last words are, this isn't the end. Of course, he means that in a metaphysical sense, because this actually is the end of the movie. In the next scene, Abby and Caleb have been dropped off in their new world. Time to get busy. It's a field of corn and they are just running around and having fun. There's a tree that suspiciously looks like it could have some knowledge of good and evil business going on with it, but I guess how that unfolds would be revealed with time. Moral of the story? Nicholas Cage.